Welcome back. Last time we had fun translating jewelry, and for homework, I asked you to see what you could make of the bracelet of Sat Hathor Unit. How'd you do? I bet it seemed easy. Let's translate it. First two hieroglyphs? Yes, Necher Nefer, the good god. Next, we have a Neb sign. What's the meaning? Yes, Lord. And that's followed by the two lands. The good god, Lord of the two lands. Next is the name in a cartouche. We've seen that name. Nematra. Last, we have two more hieroglyphs. The D sign to give and the Ankh, life. Given life. So Sat Hathor Unet is wearing a prayer for the king. The good God, Lord of the two lands, En Ma'atre, may he be given life. Good. As you will remember from last time, scribes, craftsmen, carvers, all made hieroglyphic errors. Today, I'd like to talk about what happens when it's realized that a mistake has been made. How do you erase, especially when it's carved in stone? I began thinking about this many years ago when I was showing my students the hieroglyphs inside the pyramid of King Unas. Let me give you some background to the pyramid so you'll see just how special it is. As you know, the Old Kingdom was the great era of pyramid building, especially the Fourth Dynasty. At the end of the Third Dynasty, King Zasser built the first pyramid in history, the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. Then the Fourth Dynasty took it up a notch, filled in the steps, and created the first true pyramid. Within a hundred years, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built, all two million blocks of it. Several pyramids were built during the Fourth Dynasty, and they all share a mystery, one that's rarely talked about. There are absolutely no hieroglyphs carved inside or outside these pyramids. If you created the greatest building on Earth, wouldn't you want your name on it? The only reason early Egyptologists knew that the Great Pyramid was built by Khufu was from graffiti left by Khufu's workmen, high in the pyramid's remotest chambers. Standing next to the Great Pyramid is his son's. It's almost equal in size, but still, no hieroglyphs. About a quarter of a mile from Kephren's pyramid is his valley temple, where his body may have been mummified. It's a spectacular building, built of monolithic granite blocks. But again, no inscriptions. What's going on? Extreme modesty? We really don't know. The absence of hieroglyphs is puzzling. But this brings us to the Pyramid of Unas and why it's so special. The pharaohs of the fifth dynasty had less wealth than the fourth dynasty kings and built smaller pyramids. The Great Pyramid is 480 feet tall. Fifth dynasty pyramids are about 150 feet high. The last king of the fifth dynasty, Unas, built one of these smaller pyramids at Saqqara, about 20 miles from Giza. And here he introduced a real innovation. The interior walls are covered with hieroglyphs, thousands of them. The walls are faced with sheets of limestone into which the hieroglyphs were carved. Then, to make them stand out, the hieroglyphs were colored blue. The hieroglyphs are written inside long, narrow columns carved in the wall from floor to ceiling, each column forming a separate unit called an utterance. These inscriptions are called the pyramid texts, and they are magical spells intended to ensure Unus's immortality. The principle of magic is that the word is the deed. Saying it under the right circumstances makes it true. So when the magical spell says, Unus flies up to heaven, Unus ascends the ladder, this makes it happen. The spells deal with three stages in the king's resurrection. 
First, his awakening in the pyramid. Second, his ascending through the sky to the next world. And third, his admittance into the company of the gods. These spells are the first large body of texts in the world. There were earlier documents, accounts, records, and such. But a significant body of texts on one subject, these are the first. And they're all magical. Magic is so important in these texts that one of the first spells you see as you enter the pyramid talks about Unus's magical powers. Let's look at it. The language is Old Egyptian, a little different from what we've been learning, but we can make it out. Let's start with the outstretched arms. That's like our determiner for not to know, and also the way to negate sentences. The mouth are is a way of indicating the future. It's the negative future in the Old Kingdom. What's the next hieroglyph? Yes, it's the D-I biliteral, the cone of incense. And it's the word to give. So it's not give. Okay, next, we have a couple of ends and a tethering ring and another N. Well, one of the ends is two for persons. Then we can make out a pronoun. It's chen. It's N, tethering ring, ch, and N. You in the plural. So we have, will not give to you. Next, we have the cartouche. So we know it's the king's name. And sure enough, it says unas. The rabbit is the UN biliteral, and the N under it is a phonetic complement. Then there's a reed leaf I, followed by the folded cloth S, unas, or unas, as it is frequently written. So, unas does not give to you what? The next word is twisted flax H and the ka biliteral. Heka. That's our word for magic. But notice what's right beneath it. A viper suffix pronoun. So it's his magic. Unas shall not give to you his magic. By putting it on the wall of his pyramid, Unas is making sure no one takes his magic. Isn't it cool that you can translate that? Think how far you've come. It wasn't long ago that you were just learning to write your name in hieroglyphs. There are more than 500 of these utterances. And what's maddening is that there's no clear logical order. The spells that deal with Unus awakening in the tomb don't come first, and they're scattered throughout the pyramid's rooms. The ones where he's accepted by the gods in the next world, they don't come at the end. But that's the least of our problems. What happened when a carver was happily chiseling a spell into the wall and realized he made a mistake? This was not so unusual. Remember when we saw this while we were translating jewelry? The Ha hieroglyph was misshapen? Often the carvers were illiterate. They were artists skilled at forming the hieroglyphs, but they couldn't read what they were copying. The priest would give them the text to carve on the wall, and they would go to it. But sometimes they copied the same phrase twice. Sometimes they left something out. Then the head priest would come in to check the work. He could read, and he'd discover the error. What do you do? The good news is that the ancient Egyptians had the equivalent of whiteout. They could fill in the incorrect hieroglyphs with plaster, so the wall was smooth again, and then recarve the wall and plaster with the correct inscription. We know this happened often, because over the course of thousands of years, the plaster has fallen out, and we see the errors beneath the correct texts. About 30 years ago, I was with my students inside Unus's pyramid, and we were translating a spell. It was clear, but I noticed that next to it, on the same wall was what seemed to be a meaningless jumble of hieroglyphs. We all looked at it for a while and then realized what had happened. An error had been made, plastered over, and now the plaster had fallen out. Let's look at that spell. It starts off okay. On the top, I think you can see the bottom part of an onk sign. Underneath it, 
is the suffix pronoun viper. So we have he lives. Next, another ankh, followed by Unus's name in a cartouche. So it's Unus lives. This spell is ensuring Unus has life. But right after this, the trouble starts. The jumble of hieroglyphs I was telling you about. Let's try to make something out of it. Below Unus's cartouche are two hieroglyphs we can recognize. The water sign and the reed mat P. Now the question for you is, which way does this text read? Is it right to left or left to right? We haven't had to decide this often. We've been looking at printed hieroglyphs that have all read from left to right. Now, what about this text? How do we decide? Well, let's look at Unus's cartouche to see which way the rabbit faces. It's facing right, so this is a right-to-left reading text. Okay, that means the two hieroglyphs are pen. We know that word. It's this in the masculine. Remember, ten is the feminine. We should note that the spacing of the P and the N is unusual. We've always seen it with a P on top of the N. Here, we have them next to each other, which just doesn't seem right. The N almost always takes up a full space widthwise. It alone should be under the cartouche. With a P next to it, things seem crowded. This is a clue that something went wrong. The hieroglyph below the this is the outstretched arms. This is the negation hieroglyph. Beneath it is what appears to be an N water sign over an owl with a T in front of the owl. Beneath that, very crowded, is a viper suffix. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. We can recognize one word within the jumble. The word for death, met, remember? But as we've seen, this is a right-to-left reading text, so it really says tem, which doesn't make sense. The word for die would, however, make sense here. If we read from the top of the column, we should have, he lives, this unus lives, he does not die. I think this is what was intended, but the scribe made a mistake, and the error had to be plastered over, something else carved over it. If we move six columns to the right on this wall, I think you'll see what I think was intended. Again, from top to bottom, we have he lives, this unus lives, he does not die. But look at how the hieroglyphs are positioned. For this, the P is on top of the N, as it should be. It's not cramped like the recarved version. Then comes the he does not die part. But here, the T is below the owl and is followed by the F, clearly met to die. The horn viper suffix isn't crowded here. All is well. Unus will live. Unus does not die. There are several other places in Unus's pyramid where the carvers made mistakes that were plastered over and recarved. In the end, it would have all looked perfect when Unus was placed in his pyramid, which had the magical name of beautiful are the places of Unas. The writing of one text over another is called a palimpsest. From the Greek, palimpsestos, which means scraped again. The Greeks wrote on both papyrus and parchment. Papyrus was made from the papyrus plant and parchment from animal skins. Both were expensive. So when a text was no longer needed, you scraped the ink off so you could reuse the writing surface. Almost always, these scrapings left traces of the original texts. And often, the original text is more important to modern scholars than what was written on top of it. With modern infrared photography and computer enhancement, often these earlier texts can be reconstructed. Recently, very early fragments of the Gospels have been recovered by this method. The palimpsests in Unus's pyramid are far from the only ones in Egypt. They can be found on temple walls throughout Egypt, 
And one example is often presented as support for the ancient astronaut theory, the idea that an advanced civilization came from outer space and showed the ancient Egyptians advanced technology. The palimpsest in question is at Abydos Temple. As you'll remember, Abydos was the temple where William Banks discovered the King's List, copied it, and thus helped the decipherment of hieroglyphs by supplying the names of previously unknown kings. Abydos Temple was built by Seti I, who died before the temple was completed. So his son, Ramses the Great, finished the monument. Ramses really was great in several ways. He had more than a hundred children, really. He built the fabulous temple at Abu Simbel and had an ego to go with his accomplishments. So when his father died, he completed dad's temple, but in his own way and to his own glory. The temple originally had seven entrances, so Ramses bricked up six of them so he would have additional surface area to carve his own inscriptions, proclaiming what a great son he was for completing dad's temple. But that wasn't enough for Ramses. Inside the temple, he carved out many of his father's titles and cartouches and replaced them with his own. And this brings us to the ancient astronauts and their marvelous flying machines. Just inside the entrance to the temple is a hypostyle hall, which is a fancy term for a room where columns support a ceiling. Actually, the ceiling rests on lintels, blocks spanning the columns. One of these lintel blocks has become a pilgrimage site for the ancient astronaut theorists. If you look closely at the carvings, I think you will see what looks like a helicopter, an airplane, a submarine, and a flying saucer. It really does. The helicopter is in the upper left. See the rotor blades on top and the tail to the left? To the right of the helicopter is the submarine, and beneath the submarine is the flying saucer, and beneath the flying saucer is the airplane, complete with cockpit. Its tail is on the left. All the ancient fleet is flying from left to right. So what's going on? I bet you've already figured it out. It's a palimpsest, created when Ramses recarved the hieroglyphs of his father's monument. Now that the plaster and overpainting has fallen down, we have a jumble of overlaid hieroglyphs that just happens to look like flying machines. If we look closely at the carvings, I think we'll be able to make out the hieroglyphs that make up the spacecraft. This is actually an overlay of the two ladies' name of Seti I and the two ladies' name of Ramsey II. First, the name of Seti. The crucial part of the name, for us, is the part that forms the flying machines. The hand, mouth, and arm hieroglyphs form the word smiter. Next, we have a bow with the feminine T followed by strokes. How many strokes? Yes, nine. The nine bows were the traditional nine foreign powers that were enemies of Egypt. So one of Seti's names was Smiter of the Nine Bows of the Enemies. Now, if you look closely at the carving of the helicopter, you will see that the rotor blades are the top of the bow hieroglyph. Now, look at the submarine, and you can clearly see that it's basically the hand hieroglyph, the D. Beneath it, the flying saucer is given its shape by the mouth R. Now, beneath that, the airplane is composed of the arm hieroglyph with the shoulder forming the tail. The remaining details of the spacecraft are made up of the overlay of Ramsey's two ladies' name. I think you can make out our word for behold. It's mech, the statue base M, the arm, and the basket K. Now, this word mech also means protector. 
So Ramses is saying he is the protector. Of what? Well, look at the three hieroglyphs beneath Mech. The first is part of a crocodile skin and is the KM biliteral. Next, we have a city hieroglyph with the feminine T. This is the ancient word for Egypt, Kemet. So Ramses protects Egypt. But the next hieroglyphs say he oppresses foreign lands. I think you can see his arm holding a flail above the three foreign land signs. So Ramses protects Egypt, but oppresses foreign lands. Now, if we go back to the carving, we can see that the tail of the helicopter is supplied by the arm hieroglyph's shoulder. The flying saucer's tail is made up of the shoulder from the E eh arm hieroglyph. Dropping down to the airplane in the lower right, we can see its cockpit is the T in Kemet. So that's how you build up an ancient space fleet using only hieroglyphs. It's not an accident that people who believe in ancient astronauts can't read hieroglyphs. The palimpsest at Abydos was not Ramses the Great's only one. There's a very interesting one at Abu Simbel, Ramses' massive temple in Nubia, south of the first cataract at Aswan. Nothing like Abu Simbel had ever been built before. Normally, a temple was built out of blocks of stone. Abu Simbel is sculpted out of a mountain. On the front of the temple, sculptors carved four 67-foot statues of Ramses. To enter the temple, you had to walk between the inner two. Very impressive. When you look at the temple today, one of the statue's heads is on the ground. It fell during an earthquake in ancient times while Ramses was still alive. I can just imagine the discussion among Ramses overseers of the works. You tell the Pharaoh. No, you tell the Pharaoh. The temple was a great piece of propaganda. But let me explain. There was never a large population living near this temple. This was Nubia, not Egypt. Abu Simbel was just for show. If you were a Nubian sailing north on the Nile, approaching Egypt, you would have to pass this big temple with four colossal statues of Ramses looking down on you. If you were brave enough to get off your boat to look inside the temple, as you're about to enter, on the walls are captives, bound captives, Nubians. That's a statement. Don't mess with Ramses. Then, if you went inside, you would see Ramses defeating the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh. And this is where we get another palimpsest, courtesy of an era. This one doesn't involve hieroglyphs, though. It involves art. The central figure on the left wall is Ramses. In his battle chariot, shooting an arrow at the enemy, it's an impossible scene. Normally, there would be a chariot driver and an archer. You can't drive a chariot while you're shooting arrows, unless you're Ramses. He's not going to share the glory with anyone. He's shown with the reins tied around his waist, doing it all by himself. But look at his arms. He has four. You can see it clearest with the arm that's extending the bow. What's going on? Palimpsest. The scene was sculpted on the wall. And then the master carver came and said, no, the arm's in the wrong position. Raise it a bit. So they plastered over it, recarved it, painted it, and no one was the wiser. At least not until 3,000 years later, when the plaster has fallen out and it looks as if Ramses has grown an extra set of arms. Covering up errors must have happened all the time in ancient Egypt. While we're at Abu Simbel, let me ask you a question. It's trivia. What American monument was inspired by Abu Simbel? Yes, Mount Rushmore. There's even the same number of colossal figures. Only at Abu Simbel, they're all Ramses the Great. But now it's time 
to put on your scribe robes, gather your reed brushes and ink. We're going to do hieroglyphs. And I don't want to see any scribal errors from you. Today, I thought it would be fun to show you the hieroglyphic names for some of the places we've been talking about. Let's start big with Egypt. We just saw it in the palimpsest. It also means the black land. As I mentioned early in the course, Egypt was called the red and black lands, the desert and the land along the Nile, the rich, dark topsoil along the Nile where everyone lived was the black land. Here's the word for desert, the red land. The bird is a flamingo, and it's a triliteral, de sheher. The word for red was desher. So the red land is just the word for red, feminized with a loaf and determined by a foreign land sign. So now we can say black land and red land, Egypt. We've also already seen the word for waset, which was also called Thebes by the Greeks and Luxor by the Arabs when they invaded. Well, let's look at another city we've talked about but haven't seen the hieroglyphs for, Abydos. The first hieroglyph is one we've seen before on the Narma palette in his name. The chisel, remember, it's the mer biliteral and the catfish was mer, nar mer. Well, for some unknown reason, the chisel hieroglyph sometimes has the phonetic value of ab, as if you wrote a vulture and a foot, ab. Here, it's the ab of abydos, actually abju, since the horizon hieroglyph is ju. The Greeks made it abydos. That's the sacred city where Osiris was buried. Let's do another sacred city. Remember the first hieroglyph, the column or pillar in Uun triliteral? It was pronounced something like Iwunu. This was the own of the Bible. In Genesis 4145, we are told Pharaoh gave Joseph Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Once there were more obelisks standing there than in any other city in ancient Egypt. I think these obelisks are referred to in the Bible. In Jeremiah 4313, where the prophecy is made of the destruction of the city at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Here, the Hebrew used for the city is Beth Shemesh, temple of the sun. The prophecy says, there, in the temple of the sun, in Egypt, he will demolish the sacred pillars and will burn down the temples of the gods of Egypt. The sacred pillars probably refer to the obelisks. The Greeks called the city Heliopolis, Sun City. It's just outside modern Cairo, and there's one obelisk still standing. It's a Middle Kingdom obelisk of Sesostris I. It's in a quiet park on the island of Zamalek, just a short walk from the Marriott Hotel, a silent marker of a once great city. Sometimes Heliopolis would be written with the sedge plant at the end. This is a different city and it means Southern On, the other great sacred city, Thebes or Waset as we know it. Let me show you one more Yunu. We still have the column, but now we have a water sign N as a phonetic complement for the column hieroglyph. But most important, it's feminine. It has a T at the end. This is Dendera. Dendera was, of course, the city of Hathor with her fabulous temple. Now, today, you're not getting off without homework. Let me give you a few sentences to reinforce our place names. I'd also like to use the homework to show you something I mentioned earlier in the course, but I didn't reinforce with examples. Remember way back when I mentioned that the Egyptians often had nonverbal sentences, sentences where the verb to be, you, wasn't written? For example, you might have a sentence like, we know the verb's supposed to come first, but it's missing here. We have to supply it. Since it's missing, it must be 
to be. The subject of the sentence is pata, which is singular. So we can translate the sentence as pata is in his house. This is a nonverbal construction. In our exercises in earlier lectures, I almost always wrote the verb to be because I wanted to drill it into your heads that the verb comes first. Now that I know you know that, I'd like to give you for homework a few nonverbal sentences that include our new place names. In your translations, you will supply the is or are. Let's start with this one. Then go on to this. And our last hieroglyph to English sentence is this one. Let's do one English to hieroglyph sentence as well. Do it as a nonverbal sentence, though. Try, Tutankhamun is lord of the red and black lands. I know you can do it. I'll see you next time.